Hey, greetings there. It's Mr. David again, here with module number two for the HO1, the introduction to the International Baccalaureate Program. In module one, I gave you a brief description of the course and how it's operated. In order to kind of understand the way the course is structured, it's good to understand the demands of the International Baccalaureate or IB program. So I'll be going through those um, right now. If available, please access the guide as I'll reference some page numbers so you can follow along uh, where applicable. So let's get into the International Baccalaureate Program and what exactly that is. Well, the International Baccalaureate Program is an academic organization similar to other academic organizations such as the College Board, which is responsible for things like the Advanced Placement AP Program in the United States, responsible for things like the SAT and other entities. However, what makes International Baccalaureate different is that it's actually a European organization headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, which means that the curriculum you are a part of is not only being studied by students in other parts of the United States, but it's also being studied by students in Europe, in Asia, and other parts of the globe. So what you're experiencing is a global curriculum, as well as you are becoming a global citizen, which is so valuable, especially in our 21st century world. At Bishop of Mont, there's two major ways to become a part of the IB community. The first is to become an IB diploma student. The second is to take IB courses. As an IB diploma student, you fill out an application, you meet the proper prerequisites, there are teacher recommendations involved, etc., that you complete entering into your junior year. This diploma means that you are enrolled in six IB classes throughout your junior and senior year, and you have to take all these classes. Now, some of these classes are what we would refer to as HL, or higher level. These would be classes like history, English, and foreign language. Other classes are what we would refer to as SL, standard level. Those would be classes like economics, environmental systems, and societies. Now, what's the difference between the two? Your HL higher level classes are two years, and your standard level classes are one year. If you enroll in the diploma program, your schedule is pretty tight. You are enrolled in these classes across the board. Not to say there's not some flexibility, and you also complete outside of your class uh, components of the CAS program, components of the extended essay, as well as a TOK or Theory of Knowledge course. What you're hoping to achieve by taking this program is the diploma. The diploma, which ensures a passing, which is an average passing grade on all six of your exams, which would equate to a 24, means for some schools, almost a full year's worth of college credits, really valuable stuff. If the IB Diploma Program is too strict or it seems like too much for students, well, first off, I would caution you, any student, as far as meeting the prerequisites, could handle it. Another option is to take IB courses individually. In this way, if a certain subject seems appealing to you or something like that, you can take that course, but you don't have to take all the other components. Success in IB history has come with students that are enrolled in the IB Diploma Program but also with students enrolled in individual IB courses. So it doesn't necessarily matter. What matters is going to be your work ethic, your ability to think critically, and your ability to improve, which is something we'll work on throughout the two years. Again, the IB Diploma College credit is extensive. Some schools offering about a year's worth of college credit. So you'd essentially, if you completed it, would enter in as a sophomore when you are a freshman. Now, that being the case, also, if you take courses individually, you also have the opportunity to receive credit for those courses on an individual basis. So, for example, if you just take IB History and you score a 5 out of 7, 
then you have the opportunity for many colleges to obtain college credit for just that one course. Now again, I caution you, nothing that colleges do, whether it be for IB or AP credit is universal. All schools are different. So as you go through the application process, I challenge you and I inform you that you need to look at each college individually. But nonetheless, the potential is very much there. Now, how does this work? Well, the way IB awards college credit is by taking an exam in May of your senior year. For your standard one-year classes, the class starts in August or in many cases June with a summer assignment and then goes till May, you take the exam. Now for your HL classes, those higher level two-year courses, you actually will not be taking an exam until May of your senior year. And so that is the case for history. So we have to be reviewing and constantly referencing back and improving uh, so we can do well on that exam. This is the IB Learner Profile. If you go to your guide, you can see this on uh, Roman numeral page seven. And the idea is that as an IB learner, whether or not you're a diploma program student or whether or not you're just taking the one individual course, you'll develop uh, these various learning styles and these various thinking styles. As you look at these and you explore these, there's probably one that is jumping out to you or one or two or stuff like that, and that's absolutely the case. Uh, the reality is though, as IB learners, we try to embody all these principles. It might not be all equal, but at least we try to get a little bit of that going. And as IB teachers, especially for IB history, we're gonna to try to teach to each one of these different learner profiles. So that's exactly what we'll be doing. Um, so again, I encourage you to take some time to kind of look at the learner profile and see you know, which category you fall into. And uh, I think that's really exciting. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the IB course tests and how you'll be assessed on this um, information and kind of the general form in which this will go. Now again, you don't need to be an expert on this right now, but this will help you kind of understand things a little more clearly um, as we progress through the course and as we work towards these tests in May of your senior year. First off, the first test that you'll have is known as the paper one. Now maybe this is a good time to answer the question, what does this mean paper one? Well, IB actually refers to their tests as papers which makes sense because they are all written based. Your paper one is worth 20% of your score and it takes place for one hour. This is a document based question that you're gonna learn the content and information from in your senior year. What IB says and what makes the curriculum pretty interesting as I kind of reference in module one is that IB doesn't tell teachers to teach everything. Instead, they say, hey, pick certain topics, pick certain elements, and teach those, but teach them very, very in-depth, that deep dive I was referring to. Well, for the paper one, all IB says is, here are five topics, just pick one. So I have made the decision to teach rights and protest. And so for that topic, there are two case studies. The first case study is apartheid in South Africa, and the second is the civil rights movement in the United States. If you go to page 21 of the guide, you can explore these topics a little more clearly and you can see what they're all about. The second test or paper is the paper two. In May of your senior year, you'll actually take this right after the paper one. This test is worth 25% of your grade and takes place for an hour and a half. Now, we're mainly going to be learning the content of the paper two in your senior year. However, we'll learn a little bit in your junior year. These are your world history topics. So IB says, hey, teach two topics. There are 12 total and there are two questions to each. So there's 24 total questions and you only have to answer two. However, you have to answer two questions from different topics. And so what I said is, you know what, we have time to do three. And so these are the three topics that we'll be looking at throughout junior and senior year. The causes and effects of 20th century wars. We'll actually be looking at six different wars to help our knowledge of this topic. Authoritarian states, we'll be looking at three different authoritarian states. Joseph Stalin of the USSR, Mao Zedong of China, 
and Fidel Castro of Cuba. And finally, the Cold War. This is where we see the Cold War from a really world perspective. So we'll be looking at it from a U.S. perspective, a USSR perspective, a Cuban perspective, a Chinese perspective, really a lot of things going on here. So that'll be really, really exciting. Finally, the last test that we have is the paper three. This is worth 35% of your grade and takes place for two and a half hours. The content for the paper three we address in your junior year. And when you have the test, there are actually 36 essay questions you can choose from. And there are 18 different topics, so two questions a piece. And you can answer any three you want. So as opposed to the paper two where you have to answer one question from each of the different topics, this one you can answer any three questions. So these are the major topics that we look at in the junior year. First off, there's the U.S. Civil War which is topic number eight. You can see these topics if you go to page 50 of the guide and you start to kind of go through. The emergence of the Americas and global affairs. This includes U.S. imperialism, imperialism in the Americas, as well as World War I. The Second World War in the Americas. I think speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the Cold War in the Americas. Now, opposed to the senior year, when we do the Cold War in the Americas, in the junior year, we're looking much more at just the United States and Latin America and a little bit of Canadian stuff in there as well. Finally, the last part of your assessment is a little bit different and that is referred to as the internal assessment. Now, what is the internal assessment? Well, as I kind of said in module one, this is a research paper. Now, this is where 20% of your grade. And so in your junior year, what we'll be doing is we'll be picking a topic, anything, and we'll be really working towards completion of this. And by the end of your junior year, you will have a working copy and you will have something good that's really been worked out. I provided edits and I provide feedback for you. In the senior year, what we'll be doing is adding the final touches to the IA. We'll do some peer review and some peer workshops. And then finally, we will complete it. And I will give it a score, but more importantly, um, it will be sent over to IB and they will verify my score to make sure it's accurate, consistent with the rubric, consistent with the mark bands, etc. So a two-year course and what are you going to have to show? Mastery so you can try to obtain college credit, a test for one hour, a test for an hour and a half, another test for two and a half hours, so that's five hours total, and then one research paper internal assessment. So again, we will be working towards these tests in the hopes of obtaining college credit and showing mastery. Now, the next thing that I have here is just some um, additional information on how this kind of looks. Um, again, I've kind of mentioned this already in the other one, but just so you can see it outlined. When you have your test, the paper one and two are scheduled on the same day for two and a half hours. Now there is a break. Um, paper one, there are four DBQ questions. Now they are different in size and they are different in volume, but this test takes place for one hour. In paper two, there are two world history questions for an hour and a half, so basically around 45 minutes for each one. In the paper three, again, two and a half hours. These are your America's questions, three essay questions. Um, so again, two, two and a half hour exams, internal assessment to obtain college credit. Now each exam is scored on a scale of one to seven. And then based on that and based on the percentage as I showed you in the last slide, you are given a cumulative score from one to seven. A score of one to three means you did not pass. Um, to be honest, I, I didn't include a zero because unless you don't fill anything out, you'll get a one. Um, however, a four to seven is considered a passing exam and this gives you eligibility for college credit. Now, as I referenced earlier, you need to check your colleges that you're applying to or the college that you'll be accepted to later on to see what exactly is their protocol and what exactly do they take. But nonetheless, that's just kind of the standard that we want to be looking at. Now, what I've included here, you can find in the guide but these are what we refer to as the mark bands. And the mark bands are basically what we more commonly know in the United States as the rubric. So this is how you are scored. Now you are scored for paper two, which again is your world history topics on a scale of zero to 15. 
Now again, you're really only going to get a zero if you don't write anything or you do something odd. But a 13 through 15 is what we consider the highest mark band. And so you can see what are the various components that they are looking for. Your responses are clearly focused, showing a high degree of awareness of the demands. Knowledge of the world history topic is accurate and relevant. The examples chosen are appropriate and relevant. And the response includes clear and coherent critical analysis, different perspectives, argues to a reasoned conclusion, etc. Now, if you look at the other mark bands, they have those same categories. It's just the response is not clearly focused, like for example, four to six, some understanding the response lacks clarity and coherence. So you can see they're grading on the same stuff, but what scores you in your the higher mark band is your ability to move closer to that. Same thing with paper three. The mark band is very, very similar. There's one key difference. There's no mark band er, mark about the use of case examples. Instead, it looks at these other uh, topics that the other one did as well. But again, this is how you are tested and this is how your essay response will be gauged. Now the point is, okay, we said all this stuff about the IB. You have this guide that you're looking at as I've been going through here. It's almost 100 pages and you're asking yourself, okay, what, why does this matter for this class? Well, again, I'm working towards you doing well on the exam as well as you gaining skill and history, of course, and and content skill, etc. However, in order to better prepare you, there are connections I have made between the class and international baccalaureate that are going to help you succeed. First off, all of your tests that you're going to take in this class are essay-based. Now, what do I do? I actually use old IB questions, or I make them up from scratch, but the reality is they do follow the IB format, and they're very much questions that you could be given on an exam or questions that have already been presented on an exam, but either way you're practicing and you're getting that familiarity with old exam questions. Um, just so you know, I do grade on my own scale out of 20 points. Now, the only reason I do that, not the 15 point scale, is because the 20 point scale is much more beneficial and rewarding to you as far as your percentage grade. But at the same time, in my scale, I'm still looking for the same thing. Um, so again, those things like clear responses, awareness of different perspectives, analysis, etc. Those are the same things I'm grading you on as well. So my feedback is based on that rubric. I just do it on this scale because it's much more rewarding to you um, as uh, getting a grade in the Bishop Mont grade book. Um, again, I have included on the other slides the actual mark bands, but you can also see them in your guide if you go to page 80 and then page 82 for the paper three. But familiarize yourself with these demands of each mark band so you can ensure that your essays receive the highest marks. Um, remember also, and again you can see this on the mark band, good essays are not about reciting facts, and that's always the case. But what you need to do is you need to have balanced essays with analysis and different perspectives. Now, when we get into the class and before you take your big real first test, we'll talk more about this. We'll talk about structuring your essay, etc. But if you've just reiterated straight fact in the past, not going to work here. And instead, that's not going to fulfill the other achievements. So you really need to explain why that fact or why what you've done answers the question. And so again, it's a skill and something we'll be building up, but at the same time, as long as you have this as a framework, it's really gonna help you out. Um, and again, always a big thing, and again, we'll get better at this as we go through, but the questions that IB gives are very specific. So it was an incredibly crucial to make sure that you answer the question given.